Big Buck Registries Big Buck Podcast, episode number 47, The Rack Packer, with special guest Zach Doyle. Big Buck Registry is a virtual museum of hunting stories. We preserve a piece of Americana by interviewing and recording hunters about their hunts and experiences from across the country. And who knows, maybe we'll learn a thing or two along the way that'll help us take our hunt to the next level. This is Rob Lucas from Chasing Tail. Hi, I'm Amanda Lowry, finalist in the Extreme Hunters Contest. This is Lane Benoit, Master Tracker. This is Kyle Weaver with the NRA. This is Milo Hansen. I'm Trent Cole. And I'm Richie Elam from Blitz TV. I'm Lee Lukowski. And I'm Tiffany Lukowski, and you're listening to our favorite hunting podcast on iTunes. The Big Big Buck Buck Registry Big Big Buck 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 Podcast. Podcast. Welcome to another episode of the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Podcast. It's episode 47. 47 times we've done this, and I'm psyched that you're sitting there with us right now listening to the show. I don't know if you're driving in your car. I don't know if you are listening on your couch or on your computer, but wherever you are, thank you very much for tuning in. It's a, it's an honor to have you on board and uh, hope you enjoy today's show. A couple of uh, notes I'd like to just run by. We are on iTunes, and if you are an Apple user of any sort, whether you're an iPhone user or an iPad user or a Mac user, head on over to iTunes. and Or you can, even if you're on your PC, you can go to iTunes and download the app. If you're If you're over there, please... Head over to iTunes and give us a review and subscribe to our podcast if you could and share. Please share it with your friends and let them know what we're doing over here at the Big Buck Registry. The best way to reach us over at the Big Buck Registry on iTunes is www.bigbuckregistry.com forward slash iTunes. Speaking of podcasts, uh, a lot of people ask me what podcasts I listen to when I'm on the road or uh, usually I'm on the road. I've got the earbuds in or you know, just hanging out in the backyard having a cocktail. There are a few of them that I listen to. Actually, I listen to a lot, but there is uh, the hunting podcast that I listen to. One is uh, is called Mark Kenyon's Wired to Hunt. It's making some waves in the, the rankings on iTunes. He's doing a great job over there. He has eight episodes, but he's had a couple of big names already. And I have to say that the content is very good and the audio quality is exceptional. So I think you'll enjoy that. One of my other favorites and one of our guests that we've had on our show is the wild world of, world of Carrie Z, now known as Carrie Z's Hunting and Fishing Outdoor Podcast. So if you like uh, hunting, fishing, Carrie has a very unique perspective on it, and she uh, just uh, just brought on a new co-host. So I think you'll like that. Um, one of the other ones that I am enjoying is the Wild Game Podcast with Corby Taylor. And I'd like to give a shout out to my my good buds over at Fish Nerds, Dave Kellum and Clay Groves. Both those guys are getting it done over there at Fish Nerds, and uh, hope hope to uh, hope you can check them out if you like fishing. All right, over at Facebook, we asked the question: Which deer hunting family is the most well known for deer hunting? We've had a slew of responses, anywhere from the Benoits, from the Benoits to the Nugents, to the Fitzgeralds, to the Parkers, to the Drewries, on and on. I would like your opinion as well. So when you get done listening to this show, if you wouldn't mind, go over to the Big Buck Registry. Go to bigbuckregistry.com forward slash hunting family and chime in. Let us know what you think is the best or most well-known hunting family out there. I'd like to give a big shout out to Billy Daw over at Wheelchair Outdoors for getting his Facebook page off the ground. Great job, Billy. He's approaching uh, 2,000 likes. If you get a chance, go over to Wheelchair Outdoors and give Billy a like on his Facebook page. Just a rundown of some upcoming shows we've got uh, in line. Today is episode 47. Episode 48 is going to be the Horny Buck Seed Company with special guest Doug Costrava. That's going to be May 24th. Then episode 49, we've got Lane Benoit, the master tracker from the famous Benoit family up in Vermont. That's going to be May 31st. And then our 50th, 50th episode, Lee and Tiffany Lakoski. And that's going to be our 50th show. Looking forward to that one. So, that's uh, that's the lineup coming up, guys. Um, now, let's get on to the show. Necessity is the mother of invention. It's an old uh, proverb, and, you know, sometimes when we're deep in the woods and we shoot a big buck, it's a long way back to camp. And you might be able to go get the four-wheeler, but sometimes four-wheelers just aren't allowed on certain areas. And I don't know about you, but I, I would like to avoid the heart attack 
this at this stage in my life, I'm not a young man anymore. I'm getting on in age. Um, but, and there was a day when I could hoof it for a long time, drag a big deer and have no problem. So yeah, I slowed down a little bit, have to say, but this invention that Zach Doyle and his father Keith have invented kind of kills a lot of birds with one stone. It's a device that allows you to bring your equipment into the woods. It allows you to bring your equipment out of the woods easily on a wheel. So if you don't like carrying it, it's a, it's a little easier to get in and out. It'll also support a very big buck. So it'll help you get it out of the woods and it's easy to carry. So um, ask Zach to join us and kind of walk us through some of his hunts that he's been on and tell us a little bit about how he invented the Rack Packer. So let's tune in. Zach, welcome to the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Podcast. Hey, thanks for having me, guys. I, I really appreciate this opportunity. Well, we, we appreciate you joining us. We've got, uh, we have got we were admiring the Rack Packer at the Great American Outdoor Show as we were cruising around the, the floors down over there and... Um, it caught my eye, and uh, I had to point it out to Dustin. We talked to your family and got a, a good scoop on what it was all about. And we're like, you know what? We've got to get these guys on the show somewhere down the road. Yeah, it's something that uh, that we're very excited about. It's something we've been working on for a very long time. Um, finally, you know, decided to bring it to market, and um, it's it's absolutely exploded already. the The reception has been just absolutely incredible. That's awesome. Let's get into the specs in a little bit, uh, but first, I'd like to hear the story behind you and your family. What's uh, how did you guys? Um, where do you live? Where do, where'd you grow up? What uh, what inspired you to start a product that's re- uh, hunting related? Well, you know, I, I grew up in South Central Pennsylvania, York County to be specific. And um, growing up, I, I, I was not a hunter. I did not come from a hunting family per se. My dad had hunted as a kid um, and hadn't hunted in probably 25 years when we went on our first hunt together. He actually ran into a gentleman from just north of where I grew up in Williamsport, Pennsylvania, by the name of Howard Henney who was back in the early 80s, a three-time world champion turkey caller. Hmm. And um, just became a very close friend of our family. Today, he is like an uncle to me. I call him Uncle Howard. Uh, we hunt together many times a year. And he offered to take me on my first turkey hunt with my dad when I was about 10 years old. And, you know, it, it's funny looking back. My, my mom always says that she knew from the time I was able to walk that I was going to hunt someday because anytime I was outside and I was constantly outdoors as a small child, but I always had a stick in my hand pretending like it was a gun. <laughs> and so she, she knew from day one that I was going to hunt someday. Um, but it did. It all started with this first turkey hunt, you know, spending a day in the woods with a man who has killed dozens and dozens and dozens of turkeys in his lifetime, as well as whitetails. The knowledge that was there um, and, and being able to learn from him firsthand was was just unbelievable. But, this, this is your dad you're talking about? No, this is actually the guy I consider my uncle now, my Uncle Howard. Uncle um, Howard, my, okay. Dad really didn't know a whole lot about hunting. He hunted some small game as a, as a kid, hunted pheasants as a kid when we had a good pheasant population in PA. Um, and you know, he hadn't done it in a long time and and Howard was just a very, very avid hunter turkeys more than anything. But again, you know, just, he, um, he's phenomenal in the woods, very, very successful hunter. And so that's who really sparked the fire that grew over the next couple years. Um, that, that same first fall, I actually went on my first deer hunt and killed my first deer that that first fall sitting on my dad's lap in a tree stand when I was 10. And that day is actually the day that the idea sort of started to form. That was that, that was the day that the rap hacker was born, uh, basically from necessity, like like most inventions, like most innovations, you know, they, they come from necessity. And and that day um, that was actually back in 2000. So f- almost 15 years ago, 14 years ago. Um, that's the day that, that we came up with the idea for the rack packer together. No kidding. So it must have led from some kind of uh, deer hunting experience. What? Um, so at the source of any good invention, there's a problem that needs to be solved. 
Absolutely. And the the problem that particular day, and, and again, at this time I was 10 years old. So so after I had killed my first buck, it was probably, I don't know, 9, 9.30 in the morning. You know, we climbed down onto the stand to go get it. We, we could see him laying there from the stand. He dropped right in his spot. So we went over there to get him. And of course, as any whitetail hunter knows that that's when the real work begins. So, you know, we field dressed it and being 10 years old, I weighed maybe 70 pounds soaking wet, <laughs> you know, and, and I obviously obviously wasn't going to be much help getting him out of the woods and back to the truck. Right. And so I, I, I had to basically walk along and carry the gun as my dad, who was 45-ish at the time, 44, 45, um, had to watch him drag this 170, 180-pound field-dressed buck out of the woods, probably maybe five or 600 yards. Yep. And it took us probably a good hour and a half, two hours just to get that deer that far. Um, but more than anything, he was absolutely exhausted, killing himself by the end of that, that drag. And we kind of sat down together. Um, my dad has always been very entrepreneurial. He's an absolute visionary. Um, and we came up with, with the idea for what was the first rat packer. Uh, back then we just called it the deer drag because, you know, we, we never really planned on marketing it at that time. We were kind of just making it for ourselves. Right. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's where the concept was born. I, I had actually been, been studying, um, Native Americans at the time and early American settlers in school. And they used a device back then called the Travoy. And essentially what the Travoy was, was three sticks strung together to make the shape of an A. And the pointed side drug on the ground, they slung, you know, whether it was uh, animal skin or netting or mesh between the sticks in the A-frame and the bottom of the A-frame became the handles. And there was very little drag on the ground. So we took that concept, added a wheel to the bottom, the A-frame, you know, the bottom of the A-frame still became two handles and um, we hinged it and made it fold so it was portable right. and, and so that's that's really truly where the idea came from was that that day back uh, in November of 2000 November in 2000 okay so it's 14 years ago a um, little less than 14 years ago yep got it and the the, the design and I, I don't want to get into a lot of the specifics of the design a little bit without giving away any proprietary knowledge of course mm -hmm. um, but it does have a V shape and goes down to a platform then under the platform is a mounted one wheel device correct gotcha now when I was 15 years younger than I am today. I had gotten a tip on a, on a good hunting spot and I decided to explore it. And I like to hunt alone a lot in New Hampshire. Uh, and I like to hunt big pieces of property where I can get lost uh, fairly easily kind of thing. You, you walk, you know the area, but you're not getting lost, but you could. And I had come across, uh, it was muzzleloader hunting, and I'd come across a couple of big doe that had popped up on the power line that I was on. And I was probably a good five miles from my truck at that point. And I had shot, and I downed one of the doe and went over, cleaned it up, and then my trek back began. And I thought by the end of that drag, I was going to die. It was because I was by myself. I, I had a I had a belt. And as it turns out, I was the spot where I was at. I was literally about 300 yards from a main road. But I didn't know it because I didn't know that spot particularly well. Had I and of course, I ended up hauling it all the way back. It took hours. It was only about 120 pound doe at the time. But it took me all night to get back. And when I finally got there, the deer had the, the bottom had been all scun up. They had gone through mud puddles. I did every Everything wrong, basically, that I could have done. And seeing this type of device, it always makes you want to get some kind of a easy packable device to bring with you because I didn't have a four wheeler, nor was I allowed to take a four wheeler on this property. So there are other things that could have come into play. I wish I had gotten introduced to this 14 years ago. Yeah, I think Keith, it would have saved his life. Yeah. I yeah, and that's that, that's more than anything what what we've been concerned about. You know, you you hear horror stories of guys having heart attacks in the woods. Um, you know, and, and what if one day it does save somebody's life? You know, obviously we will never know, but just the physical exertion of dragging deer out of the woods is and can be overwhelming. Um, I, I know that this this particular device has given me the freedom to hunt deeper. I, I'm the same way as you, and I hunt public ground in Southeast Ohio every year on the Wayne National Forest, and it's the the 
three sections of the Wayne National Forest together are somewhere near 100,000 acres. And so you can get very, very lost in the Wayne very quickly. And, um, you know, there are times when I'm hunting two, two and a half, three miles off the road, and, and it's not flat by any means. It's straight up and down. It's it's very rough terrain. If you've ever been to southeast Ohio, it's 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 treacherous. Uh, and, uh, I, I can vouch you for that. Uh, Wayne National Forest is no joke to hike back in. Mm. Yeah, and it's not. Uh, you know, actually, this past season, uh, we, we do a, a rut bow hunt on the Wayne, and um, I killed a buck this past season about two and a half miles from the road. He field dressed just over 200 pounds, and with the rack packer, I was able to get him two and a half miles to the road in about 45 minutes. Wow, that's and nice. It, it would have taken me all day by myself. I mean, I, you know, no help, strictly me. We actually filmed the entire process just to see how long it would take. Oh, no kidding. And um, it was just over 45 minutes, 46 minutes, but it would have taken me hours, hours to get that deer out. Hmm. Um, and, and probably had I not had this, I would not have shot simply because I was just that far away from the road. Gotcha. Now, we've talked to some experts in the field of butchery and in uh, culinary. Uh, mm-hmm. we, we spoke with Al Gambrandella from Connecticut, who had a, a deer butchery shop. And we spoke to Corey Fletcher, um, specifically on episode 31 and episode 28 of the Big Buck Registries, Big Buck Podcast. And in both cases, they both said the first thing to having a successful harvest is the shot. And then second to that is how you get it out of the woods. It protects the meat. So if you're dragging it on the ground, you're introducing bacteria that otherwise wouldn't be introduced. Do you agree with that? I, I would have to agree with that. I've been in situations before where, um, you know, I, I haven't hadn't used the deer drag or, or something to that effect. Maybe I only had to go 50 or 100 yards. And they they tend to get very dirty very quickly, especially inside the body cavity. Um, but, you know, like you mentioned with, with the long drag out of New Hampshire, um, you're talking a couple miles where the hide is getting rubbed off, the hair is getting rubbed off. And in a situation where the temperatures might be a little bit warmer or, or, or something like that, the quicker that you can get it to a butcher shop, the faster that you can get it cooled off, the better. And so why spend four or five, six hours out in the woods when it's 90 degrees when with the rack packer, you could be out of the woods in, in a third the time and, um, you know, get them cooled off and processed properly. Gotcha. Tell us a little bit about one of your most memorable hunts. I'm going to have Dusty walk you through it that involved shooting a big deer and involved the rack packer or maybe even bring us to through two hunts, one where you wish you had it and then one where you, you had it and it, it made life easier. Oh boy. Well, I can certainly tell you one where I'm, I'm very glad I had it. Other than the hunt from last year in Southeast Ohio, um, also last year, I, I live in Southwest Pennsylvania now, just South of Pittsburgh. And the terrain here is fairly similar to Southeast Ohio, not quite as steep, um, but still a lot of hills. You know, I, I'm hunting in, in river hills here, very, very steep in some areas. And I shot a buck the first day of gun season with my bow. I was probably about, probably close to a mile off the road by myself, no one around, nobody to help me. And I, I was fortunate that I had a rack packer in my truck. So I hadn't actually brought it into the woods with me. But what I did was I carried everything back out to the truck. I carried my climber out. I carried my bow out, carried all my gear back out to the truck, about a mile walk. Okay. I was able to grab the rack packer at that point, sort of shed some clothing, grab some water, walk back into the woods and load that buck up. And I was out of the woods almost a mile in roughly 20 minutes, 25 minutes. Wow, and that's it, that's impressive. Yeah, and that's that's again by myself, no help. It, it would have taken me a, a lot of that. The second half of it was all uphill. It would have taken me hours. Um, I, I had to stop twice. But when you think about dragging a deer, even if you have a rope or straps or a body harness, you're stopping every fifty to a hundred yards. And, and when you're dragging a deer fifteen, sixteen hundred yards, that's stopping fifteen, sixteen, twenty times. Um, and, and you know that was a, a situation where I was extremely extremely glad I had it. But um, yeah. honestly, I, I can't say that there are that many situations where I wish I had it because I've pretty much always had it. Mm. Um, I, except for that very first deer hunt. I'm sure my dad wished he had it. But other than that, there, there's never really been anything 
that crazy where I didn't have one available to me to get a deer out of the woods. So I guess I can jump to just probably my one of my most memorable bow hunts um, because that's that's when I turned 13. That's that's the only way that I've hunted since is strictly archery. I, I really haven't picked up a gun for whitetails ever since. Hmm. And um, interesting. So you're a purist. Yeah, yeah absolutely. It's uh, always been looking for a challenge. I, I am not a big fan of the gun season here in Pennsylvania simply because there's just so many hunters in the woods. I don't like to hunt pressured deer. I like to hunt deer in their natural state, um, you know, strictly hunt for mature deer. At this point in, in my bow hunting career, I'm, I'm out to actually only hunt mature deer. They, they have to be at least three and a half years old and, and pretty much make the Pope and Young book as a typical for me to, to harvest a whitetail at this point. Gotcha. Um, and so some of my most memorable hunts, we actually have some friends who own about 5,000 acres in Buffalo County, Wisconsin. And anybody who deer hunts, period, and knows anything about whitetail hunting knows that Buffalo County, Wisconsin is the mecca of giant bucks. Oh, wow. And so, okay. So know, that's, that's like, um, that's like Carrie Z country up there. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Yep. And so we, I actually spent eight years there. Uh, and in those eight years, we, we do a late season bow hunt in December. Um, hunted there for eight years and in that time period have killed eight bucks over 130 and um very nice i guess it would be my third my third hunt there probably 2004 um i harvested my largest whitetail buck ever and it was so cold it was actually the, the air temperature itself without wind chill was 35 degrees below zero wow and bow hunting in those kind of temperatures is is borderline insane it's it's torture you know you spend an hour and a half two hours on stand in the evening when it's warm enough to, to stand it and and even then we're again we're talking 35 below zero um that, that's that's where the deer don't want to move at all they actually almost have to move to stay warm but they yeah, don't to want stay warm. they, don't they want have to. to get up and feed you know they, they have to get carbohydrates into their body to, to fuel and and to keep warm um and on nights like that when it's freezing th those tend to be the best nights that i've had in stand out there and some of those nights you see a hundred plus deer in one big cut corn field simply because because they, they have to get out of their beds and feed. Even though they definitely don't want to, they have to get out of their beds and feed. And um, it was so cold that that I shot this buck. The arrow passed clean through. And by the time that I climbed out of the stand a couple minutes later, the arrow, of course, the blood was completely frozen to the arrow. There was wow. snow on the ground. And so I, I started looking for a blood trail. And there was spots of blood for about 10 feet and then nothing. It was a perfect shot. I knew I made a perfect shot. And um, I, I just sort of the followed the direction that the deer went. By the time that I, you know, I, I did find the buck about 125, 150 yards later, it became a Apparent that both the entry and the exit hole completely froze shut almost immediately. Wow! And so, the, just you know, a testament to how cold it was. One of the the weirdest things that I've ever had happen on a <laughs> bow hunt before, um, and definitely a very memorable hunt because it was my largest whitetail ever. Uh, just missed Boone and Crockett by an eighth of an inch, which is you know di sort of uh, sort of disappointing, but um, nonetheless a, a giant typical whitetail. Gotcha. And, uh, you know, a lot of fun hunting out there, even though it's almost never above zero in December. Yeah, that's definitely some cold conditions to be archery hunting in. Yeah. You're taking a chance on bowstring breaks. I mean, there's all kinds of different scenarios that can bring upon your equipment. Yeah, I actually, um, I actually, I, I hate shooting a bow with gloves on, period. And um, I touched my hand to the, the bare metal, you know, the bare painted metal of a bow riser in 2008 and actually got frostbite on the palm of my hand. It all blistered up and fell off a couple days later. You know, the dead skin fell off a couple a couple days later. Wow, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It makes you maybe not want to go hunting in Wisconsin. So you've got a lot of complications <laughs> there that you just don't have when it's like, <sighs> slightly warmer. That's you nuts. You know, it, it's, um, I would hunt there if it was 100 degrees below zero. It, it's the most phenomenal whitetail hunting I have ever seen to be able to sit in a stand and see 100, 150 deer every single evening. Um, to see multiple bucks in a four or five day hunt that are over 130, 140, 150 
when I harvested my first whitetail out there that was 151 inches, um, there was 14 bucks in the field, almost within shooting distance that would have made Pope and Young. And I was 13 years old. I had never seen deer like that in my life. You know, didn't, didn't know that that, that existed at that point. Um, really one of my first bow hunts and just, you know, the hunting out there is, is totally different than it is on the East Coast. Uh, you know, I've been fortunate to hunt whitetails in a lot of different states, hunt other game in a lot of different states. And when it comes to whitetail hunting, there, there isn't anything like, you know, the Buffalo County, Wisconsin's, the Pike County, Illinois, you know, down in, uh, Southeast Iowa. Um, you know, there, there's just nothing like it. So when it was, we're going to break down a little bit of what, how you hunt and, and kind of what you do when you, when you're out in the woods. Tell us a little bit about your tree stand setups. Are you, are you a hang on, you, are you a ladder stand, a ground blind? Tell us what you use for as tree stand setups. I, I'm a hang on guy. Um, I run probably between my dad and I, we, we have somewhere between 40 and 60 hang on stands, sticks, steps, you know, every kind of combination you can imagine, uh, between the properties that we hunt in Pennsylvania. And, um, I've really always been a hang on guy. I like to hunt very, very high, you know, 25 to 30 feet, try to stay above their noses as best I can. But more than anything, it's putting the time in before the season. Um, I, I spend probably somewhere between not as much time as I used to, but probably between 150 and 200 days a year in the woods right now, whether it's just for an hour going for a walk or spending all day on a Saturday scouting, even when it's, you know, the wintertime right now, I'm constantly scouting, constantly running trail cameras, um, tweaking stands, you know, trying to find new properties to hunt, new locations to hunt. It's it's a lifestyle for me. It's it's an everyday thing. All right. Tell tell me what. Give me a kind of a percentage on uh, on a hundred percent scale of how much scouting improves your 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 finished product as far as your harvest. It's a hundred percent. There's I would a hundred and fifty percent. I could never the properties that I'm hunting in Western Pennsylvania now. Quite a few of them receive some pressure from other hunters. Um, you don't have very long in the first couple days of archery season to to harvest a buck and you know then you're waiting until the first couple weeks in November until the rut hits and hopefully you get lucky but you basically have to get it done here within the first couple days of the season or those first two weeks in November and so you better know that first morning that first evening where a particular buck is going to be uh, I typically have the bucks that are on my hit list picked out by the end of July beginning of August and typically by the first week or second week of September they're uh, you know I, I have their patterns pretty much figured out at that point. Now, whether they continue to follow the script that first week of, week of October is a totally different story. But um, typically here in Pennsylvania, there's there's just so much pressure, even in archery season now, that, that they tend to shut down pretty well after that, um, at least on the properties that I'm hunting here. And they're large properties. Um, but, you know, of course, scouting the food sources is key. That first week, they're still really hitting food sources hard. And, and as long as you can find that their main food sources you can kill them the first week, but that's all, that's all scouting and it, it changes every single year. Right. Do you guys do any kind of food plots out there? I don't. Um, the, the properties that I'm hunting here are all privately owned, but most of them, again, there's a bunch of other hunters that hunt them. Uh, I'm typically, I actually don't have any properties here in, in Southwest PA that I hunt alone. Um, and most of them are 100% wooded, and so it would take bulldozers and things like that to, to clear a, an area for a food plot. Um, if it were my own property, yes, absolutely, I would be putting in food plots. But here, you know, here on the properties that I'm hunting now, that's almost not an option. Um, so keying in on the natural food sources, particularly that first week of October, acorns. If you can find acorns here, you know, you're golden. Um, there's not a whole lot of agriculture here in, in the, the area that I'm hunting now, which is what I'm used to hunting back in York, you know, it was almost nothing but agriculture. And so that that's a, a whole different ball game in and itself. Right. And being able to adapt to different conditions, different terrain and, you know, different food sources, you, you got to pretty much be a library for deer activity in all different areas, you know, hunting different states. And how important is it to know what the deer like and, and where they're going to be grazing for food? 
Uh, again, that the first week of the season, that's everything. The first week or two of the season, those food sources, their primary food sources are everything. Those food sources typically change, though, within those first two weeks of the season. And so you have to sort of know, you know, okay, what are they hitting in the summertime? A lot of times all summer long, they're, they're feeding on nothing but green. And then those first two weeks of October, third week of October, they really change to those mass crops with high protein content like acorns. And if you can find a good stand of white oaks that has produced acorns, acorns that particular year, you're going to see deer. Um, Southeast Ohio has been the ultimate test of that simply because the areas are so vast. I don't have time to get out there and scout. And so when we go there the first or second week of November, it's um, find the food sources. Even that first first second week in November, still find those food sources because that's where the does are going to be. And in the beginning of November, where the does are going to be is where the bucks are eventually going to be. And so that's that's really what it comes down to is being able to identify their primary food source. Uh, a lot of times in, in a banner year for acorns, there's so much food in the woods that you almost have to key in on something different and finding that little tweak, whether it's an apple tree or further south persimmons or, you know, whether it's a stand of honeysuckle, um, just that that one little something different that that maybe they're hitting other than acorns, you know, that that's really the the key to, to targeting big mature whitetails. Um, yeah, that's, that's awesome tips right there, you know, and that's kind of, you, you brought out what I wanted you to there. And that's awesome. You kind of give different tips for different areas and what works best for you. And, uh, you know, the listeners really enjoy the content and thank you for that. Tell us a little bit about, uh, some of your hunting clothes as far as, you know, what kind of camouflage and do you use any kind of soaps or scent control sprays? Walk us through your set, your, your riggings. Yeah, I, I try to stay as scent free as possible. It is absolutely impossible to stay to, to stay completely scent free. You know, we're constantly breathing. I, I truly, personally believe that more than anything, a, as long as you keep your clothes clean with a good scent killer detergent, spray down a little bit with you know scent killer spray when you're in the stand. I like to to transport my clothes in a scent proof bag from my home into my vehicle, out into the field, and get dressed in the field. Um, I, I do try to take the necessary steps to stay as scent-free as possible, but truthfully, more than anything, you you really have to hunt the wind. Uh, that's why I have so many stand setups is because I'm constantly hunting, you know, or hanging sets for different wind directions. Uh, and, and I think that's, that's key more than, you know, are you wearing scent control clothing? Are you spraying down with scent control sprays? How are you controlling the scent that's coming from your mouth. Um, you know, th those things are, are really impossible to control. If you're hunting a place like Southeast Ohio, the, the first two years that I hunted there, we stayed in tents all week long and, and really didn't have a way to shower. Um, we did a, a true rough in it hunt. And in those situations, it's impossible to stay scent free. You're just not going to do it. So you do, you, ha you really have to hunt the wind, but any way that you can keep your scent down and I try to take every step there is possible, do it. Um, walk, walk know, us, walk us through them steps. Like say, say you just pull your, your hunting attire out of your bag. You, do you spray? Tell us what you do there. And, and yeah, I, I typically, I mean, obviously I, I wash with a scent killer detergent. I hang everything outside to dry and then I, I spray everything down again while it's hanging to dry, put it directly in a scent control bag. Typically, my hunting clothes do do not come in contact with anything but, you know, outside um, until they're ready to be washed again. And I, I try to wash them about once every week, once every two weeks with scent and do that whole process over again. I spray down when I put them on. I spray down when I get in the tree. Sometimes I'll spray down while I'm in the tree. Uh, another little tip, one of my, my favorite cover scents, and this is, uh, this is something that, that I can really attribute some of my success to because, you know, I, there were times when I've been hunting places like Southeast Ohio and haven't had the chance to shower or wash my clothes. Um, you know, when wind is blowing directly at deer and, and they're not alerted at all. But the cover scent that I, that I love like more than anything is called deer dander and it's by team fitzgeralds um it's a synthetic cover scent that mimics the actual smell of a deer hmm. very similar to um if you've heard of vs1 or um deer herd in a stick things of that nature but it's in a spray form and um i'm and it's actually called, it's, it's called, called deer dander yep okay. it's called deer, deer dander it comes in a spray bottle it's about 15 bucks a bottle and who'd you um, say that I, was made by it's made by team fitzgeralds 
And uh, I'm writing that down right now. Yeah, yeah me too. It's, 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 it's got uh, my curiosity. The deer dander. Yes, it's phenomenal stuff. Again, it's synthetic. It never goes bad like normal scents do. Um, I'm very, very allergic to animal dander. And really? if I touch deer with my bare hands, typically I break out in hives, which is uh-huh. odd. Uh, if I get this synthetic deer dander on my skin, yeah. I break out in hives. Really? What really. the heck? How does that yeah. happen? And, and it's synthetic. It's not real deer dander, but it's chemically exactly the same as deer dander. And that's, you know, that, that's All sort right. of, uh, that's sort of saying a lot for a chemical scent. If it, if it makes me break out in hives like a deer does, it's got to smell like a deer. All right. Now, so, you, you got to ask right. yourself. All right. Though. Hold on. We right. got to back up here. We got to back up. <laughs> Who in the heck spends their time <laughs> studying deer dander? <laughs> you know, I, I don't know, but I'm going to tell you what, it, it works. It, it works, yep. period. A, a close friend of mine introduced me to it about 10 or 12 years ago, and in that time period, I've probably gone through 50 or 60 bottles of it. You know, I uh-huh. use three or four bottles a year. So, so uh, tell me, t- tell me real quick, you're allergic to deer, uh-huh. but you spray this deer dander on it. So you have to put on a rain suit or how you, how you go about it? No, I, I try to just <laughs> only spray it on my clothes. I try to keep it off of my skin. So I spray it on okay. my clothes, on my boots a little bit, hit a shot on my hat when it's off my head, you know. Right. Uh, and what happens but, when you become allergic? Like, is it like a, a rash or how, yeah, what happens? Yeah, it's just high. It's nothing severe. Okay. Yeah, just a minor allergy, but it, it was, it was very odd the first time I ever got it on my skin. I broke out in hives and um, immediately I knew somebody's doing something right because deer make me do the same thing. That's interesting. Yeah. I do the same thing with health food. <laughs> <laughs> I think I got the same disease you do, Jake. <laughs> uh, that's, I mean, that's, it sounds like this deer dander is something we got to try out. So thanks for that tip. That's awesome. Yeah. It's good stuff. Very cool. That's um, very cool. Yeah. You know, that's, that's uh, interesting that you're allergic to it and this deer dander spray breaks you out. That's what's really amazing. Amazing. I know it's uh, it's sold a lot of bottles of, of deer dander to other people. The fact that that I'm allergic to it, right? Crazy. Let's uh, let's let's get back to the rack packer a little bit. I want to I want to break it down into uh, the design. I'm reading some of your your description from Facebook, and it, it you talk about this uh, this o- slightly overweight guy in his mid 40s and how he was able to pull this buck out of the woods, which is the story you told a little earlier. Uh, your mm-hmm. father, your father named Keith. I can relate to Keith because I'm a slightly overweight, forty mid forty year old man. Um, this is exactly the kind of thing that I need because I I couldn't do that deer pull or deer drag that I did twenty years ago, fifteen years ago. There's no way I could do it again today without probably having a heart attack. Is what right. I'm right. And and you know, let's be honest, ninety percent of your listeners today are in that same boat. That's exactly what I was about to say. I guarantee you that anybody that's overhearing this conversation is probably in the same boat. The majority. Yep. For the most part, I would have to agree with you. Right. So if nothing else, this will reduce the amount of effort that you need to drag a deer or get a deer out of the woods, bottom line. Yeah. I mean, I'm I'm 25 years old yep. and I'm in incredible shape. Um, I still <laughs> will not go in the woods without it. That's a testament right there. I mean, if you're in why, great, why wouldn't Why you? work harder than I have to? Right. You know? Right. Um, Zach, you, how, how much have you studied the Native American way of life? Well, we studied it a lot in grade school, middle school. I mean, it seemed like almost every year we were studying Native Americans. Uh, so, you know, I, I saw a lot of sketches of the Travoy. Um, that's really all there was, was just sketches of a Travoy. I've never actually seen one in person or seen one used in person because it's you know, very antiquated technology. But it, it seemed to be the perfect platform for the rack packer simply because it's so simple. Um, it, it made our manufacturing process very very simple, but it's also extremely effective. Having only one single point of contact with the ground is actually much, much more stable, especially over uneven ground than mm. having two points of contact, a cart with two wheels uh, that tend to tip over. Or, you know, if you're walking on the side of a hill, it's not level with only one single point of contact with the ground. It's, it's always stable. It's always level with your shoulders. Right. Okay. Gotcha. And so that's, that's really where the idea came from was again, the Travoy 
was so successful and so widely used in early settlement that, you know, why not take an already existing excellent design and make it better? Why do you think the, the society got away from that design for the mo- for a little while? Just just uh, the, the engine or something like that? Yeah, probably that. And um, I, I don't know, I guess traditional thinking has been that, that two wheels or three wheels or four wheels is always going to be better than one. Right. And, you know, unfortunately, that's that's not the case. Gotcha. All right. Tell us more about the Rack Packer itself. You spent 12 years developing the design, correct? Yes. What? Tell us about those early prototypes. What happened back then? The early prototype was actually just a tiny bit longer than the current unit. Um, it had two hinges instead of one. It was a trifold unit. Mm-hmm. And the upper section that was that was handles they were actually curved a big long curve and they hooked around your shoulders hmm. and then when the unit unfolded there was push pins like locking push pins on those curved portions and you actually had to spin them around so that you could use them the right way as handles and so there was too many moving parts uh, the unit actually didn't stay on your body securely because the rounded handles didn't fit your shoulders perfectly okay and so that that same unit was the unit that I used two hunting seasons ago when I had to bring that buck out of the woods about 15, 1600 yards, almost a mile. Okay. And on that haul out of the woods, I, I was just constantly racking my brain thinking, how can I make this better? How can I make it simpler? How can I make it more comfortable? How can I make it quieter? So that was one of the issues that we had before was those, you know, those handles that spun all the way around. Um, they rattled a little bit and they were a tiny bit noisy. We had to have padding on them, like this, this, uh, fabric padding and that slipped all around. It made them very, very large and hard to get your hands around. You know, I, I wish I had a picture of it around somewhere. But um, it, it was just too complicated and not comfortable enough to take in the woods with you all the time. And so on that walk back in, I thought to myself, you know, it would be so easy if we just made this unit completely straight when it's unfolded and threw a pair of backpack straps on it. It would also make it lighter. And and so that's that's what we did. We eliminated all of the, the crazy moving parts um, and uh, just, just made the unit almost completely straight. We actually did have to mandrel bend the tubing uh, just a little bit on the ends to make the handles pretty much level to the ground when you're using it uh, you know that way it made them easier to hold on to but um that's sort of how it evolved so so once i got done with that hunt i, I came back in and went to the drawing board again and and uh, actually took it to our manufacturer and said this is what i want to make happen and we produced one made a few more tweaks to it and um we actually just made a few more tweaks a couple weeks ago and changed the straps again made the straps much much simpler much more solid um and and the unit itself itself is now even more effective. So it's constantly in the drawing board. We're constantly making changes, making it better, mm-hmm. taking suggestions from people who are using it in the field. What problems are they having? What, you know, what issues are they running into? And if it's something that we can change or something that we can make better, we make them better. Gotcha. I, I got a quick question. I'm going to jump in there, Jay. Absolutely. Tell us about the, the terrain that, that you've crossed with this particular rack packer. Yeah, there, there's actually um, the video that we were showing at the, the outdoor show over there in Harrisburg showed a lot of the terrain that that I crossed in Southeast Ohio. I was actually putting it through a torture test last year. I wanted to see, can I take this thing over small logs? Can I take it over big logs? Can I take it over rocks? Can I take it through vines? You know, what can I, how bad can I beat this thing up and will it take it? Will it hop up over all this stuff? And it it passed with flying colors. Um, You know, you can see in the video on our website, some of the highlights of me pulling it up over rocks and logs and through, you know, all kinds of stuff on side hills, downhill, uphill, flat ground. Um, we take it absolutely everywhere. The hinge d- design, actually, if you hit a big enough log, you know, a 12 or 14 inch diameter log, the unit will actually hinge with the deer on it. And it, it makes it much, much easier to pull it up and over the log. And until you've tried it, it's hard to understand, but it's, it's absolutely incredible how something that we really weren't planning on worked out really, really well. 
Awesome. Have you have you taken this thing and, and you know like I got a, a deer cart. And that's uh-huh. kind of what I use. It's just a homemade, uh, you know, just like a two wheel deer cart. Right. And I throw this thing in the back of the truck. Well, obviously the salt here in Ohio. If I run it through the winter months, I just I, I take a uh, cable lock, throw it in the back of the truck, and it's there till season's over. Mm-hmm. Have you tested this thing and, and just leaving it out in the elements? See what the uh, you know how's the hinges hold up? Is salt does the salt eat into it at all? Tell us a little bit about that. It the is durability. actually the unit itself is steel and it is powder coated, so we don't really have many issues with corrosion unless you chip that powder coating away. You'll get a little bit of corrosion, right. but it's all um, you know I haven't had any issues with the hinges. Everything is laser welded, so the unit is very very solid. I had one in the bed of my truck from like the middle of September, actually before that, because I take my tree stands into the woods on it. Um, I, I load a couple hang-ons and a couple sets of sticks on it and take them into the woods a couple at a time. Hmm, that's a good idea. I like that. But, yeah. I've, I've had it in the bed of my truck. It's still there. Um, in snow, in rain, in ice, in all the salt here in Pennsylvania, you know, in, in all kinds of stuff since September, August, something like that. Um, the grips yeah. on the handles are still in perfect shape. I've used it on probably eight or 10 deer this past season. Um, you know, everything is, is pretty much in perfect condition. There are a few tiny spots of rust where some of the powder coating has chipped away on the main frame. But other than that, you know, it, yeah. It sounds like sounds like you put it through the gauntlet, you know. That, that's yeah, awesome. That a, you, you try a little bit of everything. It's an extremely solid unit. It, it's very impressive that we can have a unit that is so light but yet so strong. It, it will physically hold more weight than you could pretty much pick up off the ground with it. Hmm. Right. Well, is there a weight capacity on the, the, the unit? We have the weight capacity rated at 300 pounds because the average uh, adult will not be able to transport more than about 300 pounds on it. Um, it's, it's just a lot of weight. Uh, I actually personally, when we had, it was actually unpainted, no grips on it, anything. One of the first ones that came out of production, um, the gentleman who does our manufacturing for us is um, a, a fairly large man, probably 400 pounds or so. And I was able to pick him up on it. Again, I'm 25 years old and, and in good shape, but I was able to pick him up on it and wheel him around the warehouse. Hmm. And there was not even the slightest sign that it was going to flex or bow or, or, or anything All for right. that matter. So let's, um, let's say you go out, out in the woods with your good buddy and you know say he's from ohio say i'm hunting with my friend from ohio and he is tired been hunting all day could i put him on the rack packer and pull him out of the woods you could put him on the rack packer i actually have some pictures from last summer um are you talking about me jay oh oh yeah um I have some I, pictures I, from last summer of me <laughs> on the rack packer and some video. At least they blew an ankle. Yeah, it, yeah. You know, it was summertime so, and uh, we were trying to take take some pictures. Obviously, there was nothing in season in Pennsylvania in the middle of the summer. So uh, I, I put myself on there and uh, had my younger sister pick me up and wheel me around. And hmm. uh, absolutely, yeah. you could do or, that. Or, yeah, it could be, you know, a, a, an injury type thing. Maybe right. maybe falls out of the tree stand. Or, um, I think Jay, Jay would be more or less like to carry a cooler to the party. Yeah, or let's yeah. say you want to bring a cooler beer to the tree stand. <laughs> you know, we actually had a had a family purchase one at the outdoor show, and all they want to do with it is is take their belongings, cooler, blankets, you know, all kinds of stuff like that, down to the beach. Huh. I can see that. I can see how that. How much does that unit weigh? It weighs right around fourteen pounds, right wow. between fourteen and fifteen pounds. So it's extremely light. Um, at, at this point, I take it in the woods with me pretty much all the time because the backpack straps are comfortable. I strap my backpack right to it um and and just a little uh, just to let the cat out of the bag a little bit here we're actually working with a backpack company right now who's going who wants to manufacture a pack specifically for the rack packer gotcha um that you'll be able to buy as an extra as an accessory that will you know attach right to it so you don't need to take a backpack in with you um but I, i take everything in on it i've actually strapped the rack packer to my climbing tree stand on my back you know together they weigh roughly 30 pounds 32 pounds something like that that. It's fairly heavy uh, for a long hike, but a, a lot of times if I'm going to be, especially when we hunt Southeast Ohio, I take it in with me and I, if I'm going to hunt the same tree for three or four days, I just leave it right at the base of the tree, cover it up with some leaves and, um, you know, it, it's there when I need it. All right. That, that seems like, a you know, 32 pounds. That's like the pack or a heavy pack that, uh, like a military heavy pack that would, could walk around. I think they even get more like 60. So yeah, that, that would be a good, 
it's not too much, but it's still it's, you can still do it basically. Right. Yep. And a lot of times I can get away with hunting out of a fanny pack. You know, having a nice multi pocket fanny pack. So you know, carry that in my climber, the rack packer, and my bow. That's awesome. awesome. I actually shot a doe in the early. We have a, a special regulations early season here that starts uh, in September in this part of Pennsylvania, and I actually shot a doe with my bow on the walk in to where I was going to hunt with my climber, and I had my climber and the rack packer on my back when I shot the doe. That's crazy. So, oh, wow. I, I'm just visualizing that. That's uh, that's pretty intense. So you could you could actually hunt with all your gear and this on your back. Well, I guess you could if you're in good shape. Yes. Yeah, even if you weren't, even if you had only the rack packer on your back, you know, weighs 14 pounds, it's very, very easy to shoot a gun or shoot a bow while wearing the unit. That's pretty cool. It's, it's exactly the same as Look, wearing a back. We've talked about the rack packer. Let's, let's talk about the price. What you call the, where can they go to order one? Let's get into that. I mean, I'm, I, well, before we get into the price, I'm thinking a tree stand, a hanging tree stand of high heavy qu- duty quality should run, what, a couple hundred bucks? Yeah, you look at like a lone wolf hang on tree stand and they, they're sort of the upper end of the price range for hang on tree stands. Just a lone wolf hang on tree stand alone, they run anywhere between two hundred and two hundred fifty dollars for a hang on okay. tree stand. All right, so um, we should expect you know, your to pay price for a good hang on probably a hundred to one hundred and fifty dollars. All right, so. We should expect to pay probably what two two fifty for this unit. No, you you will pay half that for this unit. Uh, the full price is one twenty nine ninety nine. If you are at the outdoor show and visit our booth at the outdoor show, um, and as well as if you're coming to the show in Ohio this let's see next weekend, mm-hmm. um, we run specials at the shows for ninety nine dollars. So you can get a rack packer at one of these outdoor shows for ninety nine dollars. That's awesome. That's yeah. a bargain. What, uh, and, the, and the normal price is, is uh, 129 as I said. Uh, you know, if you come see us at our booth at, at, at these outdoor shows, these expos, um, you're also saving yourself shipping, too. So you're actually saving roughly $50 by getting one, let's say, at the, uh, the Ohio Deer and Turkey Expo uh, next weekend. So if I wanted to ship one, does it cost more to ship? It, it's pretty uh pretty reasonable shipping for a, a big box and a unit that weighs 14 15 pounds uh you know we charge 18 dollars for shipping so that's um, great that's... sort of a flat rate to anywhere anywhere in the the continental 48 and um you know 139 plus your shipping is, is what you'll pay on uh www.therackpacker.com the rack packer r-a-c-k right that's correct okay yep r-a-c-k p-a-c-k-e-r uh, you can also find us on facebook under the same name the rack Backpacker on Facebook. Uh, we're constantly running specials, running contests, running giveaways. Uh, I'm actually doing a youth, a, gu- a fully guided and professionally videoed youth turkey hunt giveaway right now on our, we have a special youth turkey hunt day here in Pennsylvania, a week before the season opens. That's cool. And so I'm giving away a youth turkey hunt. It was an essay contest. You had to be under 16 years of age and, and write me a 250 to 500 word essay on what being in the outdoors means to you. And for that, I'm giving away an overnight stay at a hotel here in southwest Pennsylvania, uh, a set of um, a slate and glass pot turkey call from um, Buffalo Valley Game Calls out of Pennsylvania, as well as the fully guided turkey hunt that will be videoed with me uh, here in southwest Pennsylvania for, for a lucky youth hunter. I think that's cool that you're doing an essay. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago, Zach. I think it's cool you're doing an essay instead of just, uh, you know, just randomly picking. I think that's neat. Getting, getting yeah. it to write. That's, that's awesome. Yeah, you know, I, I want youth hunters to get involved. I also want their parents or their guardian to get involved as well. Uh, I, I really encouraged the parents, the guardians to help them write the essay, sit down with them and write the essay, because that's that's really truly what it's all about. They obviously have to bring their guardian with them as well. So that's what it's all about is, is spending time together. Um, and, and truthfully, that's what I'm going to be looking for and what the other judges are going to be looking for in the essay is, you know, what did they talk about mentioning family values, mentioning spending time with, you know, their dad or spending time with their mom or their brother, getting that quality time, because that, that's what it has always been about for me. Uh, there, there are very few other things that a father and son or a father and daughter, mother and daughter, whatever it may be, can do together and spend the kind of out, uh, the kind of quality time that you can spend when you're together in the outdoors. 
Right. You just you just don't find that kind of time, that kind of bonding to be alone together, share those experiences together. You know, uh, I've been hunting with my dad since I was 10 years old. One of the hardest things for me over the past two years now that I live about three hours from him is not having the opportunity to hunt with him every day like I've always done. Right. Gotcha. What uh, tell us about a warranty? Does this thing come with a warranty of any sort? Yeah, it has a one year unconditional warranty uh, against manufacturer's defects. If you break something, if something breaks, one of the straps breaks, one of the buckles breaks, you name it, we'll replace it. So okay. for one year from your date of purchase, if something breaks, we'll replace it. Okay, very cool. And I'm going to put you on the spot here, Zach. What can you do for our listeners if they want to buy a rack packer? Well, I can give them a coupon code that we've been using uh, at the shows. If they want to use it, it will save them 30 bucks. It'll give them the $99 price. And all they have to do is enter that coupon code in our checkout process on our website. Again, that's therackpacker.com. Okay. Um, and that coupon code is Zach, my first name, Z-A-C-K-V-I-P. So Zach, V-I-P, and it's going to be in all capital letters. So okay. Zach, V-I-P, in all capital letters will give you a $99 price tag on the Rack Packer strictly through our website. That's awesome. It's very generous of you, and thank you for doing that for our, our community at the Big Buck Registry. That's awesome. Um, very cool, Zach. Zach, tell us, uh, just wrap up, tell us how we can reach you. I know it's the RackPacker.com, the R-A-C-K Packer.com. Um, how about an email address? Yeah, you can reach me again at my first name, Zach, Z A C K dot rackpacker at gmail.com. So okay. that's Zach dot rackpacker at gmail.com. Uh, I'm more than willing to, to have a conversation with anybody who wants to have one. Questions, comments, you name it. You can also contact me. I run our Facebook page. Uh, again, it's the rackpacker on Facebook. If you do a search on Facebook, for some reason, it made us make the word rackpacker two words. So it's three words, the rackpacker. Uh, if you send us a message on Facebook. You know, I I reply to them almost instantly. I get the messages right to my phone um, and I reply to them typically just about instantaneously. So if you have questions, if you have comments, if you live in this area, um, well, I guess by the time this airs, we will have already picked a youth hunter for the for the contest. But pay attention for the fall because we're going to be running a deer hunt. So pay attention for an essay contest coming in the fall. You'll only be able to find that information on our Facebook page. So you'll have to stop by, like us, Um, and and keep an eye out for the fall because we will be running a youth deer hunt giveaway in the fall, another essay contest. Very cool. Very cool. Um, Let's see. And how about a phone number, Zach? I know uh, know phone dialing your phone these days is a little old school, Uh, but if if we want to call you, how do we reach you? Yeah, if anybody needs to get a hold of me, uh, I'm perfectly fine with giving away my personal cell phone number. It's the best way to reach me. That number is 717-309-0490. And again, that's my personal cell. It's the best way to get a hold of me. If you have questions about the Rack Packer or just want to call and talk, hey, by all means. That's awesome. Well, for from all of us uh, middle-aged uh, men that are slightly overweight, we thank you for creating such a great product. That's awesome. <laughs> Very and cool. I thank you guys again. I really appreciate you having us on and, uh, you know, can't wait to, to continue to follow your podcast in the future. But thanks for joining us on the Big Buck Registry. Hey, thanks for having right. me, guys. Awesome. Thanks again to Zach Doyle for joining us on the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Podcast. Uh, it's just a pleasure listening to how, you know, different inventions get uh, play, put in play in the outdoor industry. And certainly this one uh, would help me. Hopefully it will help you as well. And uh, definitely take advantage of that special offer that Zach pointed out in his interview. Uh, Dusty, how can uh, people find you? Facebook.com forward slash Chubby Tines Outdoors, Chubby Tines at Hotmail.com. Jay, how can the people list get in touch with you at the Big Buck Registry? All right. A bunch of different ways if you want to share a picture or if you're looking for a share for share type situation on Facebook. Um, it's Facebook.com forward slash Big Buck Registry. Uh, Twitter is Twitter.com forward slash Big Buck Registry. You can send me an email to Jay at Big Buck Registry.com. And if you would like to give us a call, give us some feedback about this particular show or any of our other shows, 724-613-2825. And you can actually use that to text a picture and a story about a deer you might have harvested. Um, instead of sending it to Facebook or emailing it in, you can send it to that that or text it to that phone number. Um, and then always go to iTunes and uh, give us a review on iTunes and let us know what you think about the show. 
and uh, you know, we appreciate those five star reviews. But if uh, you know we're a little off the mark for something that you didn't like, that's okay too. Um, anyway, that's uh, I think that's about it, Dusty. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and thanks for uh, tuning into the show, and uh, we look forward to what we got to come in the future with you. Absolutely. All right, man. Uh, I'm Jay Scott. And I'm Dusty Phillips, and this is the Big Buck Registry's Big Buck Podcast. See you next week. Can't wait.